now we have our third and final treat for the evening. Uh, Rob is going to ask a couple of the folks that were integral in this coming together to come up and take a seat. Norman Lichtenfeld is here. Okay. And Well, Norm gets the uh, wheelchair. George Shomo is here. He's going to be on the panel. Our editor and fellow producer, Frederick Lumiere. He's sitting up and joined us. Frederick uh, and I worked very closely the last nine months together in it. This close, just about, in an edit room. This man is a genius. And uh, many of you may, may not know, he's also the director and producer of the History Channel's 10-part series, World War II in HD, which aired in November 2009. So he's, he's the king. And also joining the panel is Direct from London, across the pond, is Jamie Havas. Our cinematographer with all those stunning visuals. So you'll hear a, a true English accent from this gentleman. Okay. Since I think we have one more chair here on the wing, I'd like to recognize some people that were involved with the film. I'd like our visual effects supervisor to stand up, Jonathan Gibson from... Toronto. Also with us, uh, he's, uh, he's really a nice guy, <laughs> is Lieutenant Colonel Max Hansen. Actor Ken Arnold is here. I've, I've got one chair up here. I'll, Ken, do you want to join us? You're an actor, you can ham it up. <laughs> um, sure. While we're waiting for Joe, what I, um, I wanted to mention about Ken is his ancestry is German. And when Frederick actually recommended that we use Ken for the part, um, I, I thought he looked fantastic. And I said, I just assumed he knew German. He didn't know a word of German. And I said that I wanted the, the part to be read in German. So why don't you take it from there? I panicked. <laughs> um, actually, what had, hap what had happened was uh, after I agreed to do it, two days later, I was working on a video for the IRS in Washington, D.C. And uh, they sent me in to get makeup. And the makeup artist was from Germany and she spoke fluent German and I told her that I was working on this project and I asked her if she knew anyone who could help me with my German and she said I can do it so I went and I met with her and we worked on it and I worked on it for a good uh, month beforehand so I could I could be as close as possible but you know I could I could achieve so. oh. can I add a little something to this you know, it's a testimony in how good of a friend Ken is to me, um, because he, he worked with me on two films before. He was a, a loving dad in Tomorrow's Today, and then he was a, a Catholic priest in Father McGivney. And I said, Ken, uh, I think we have a role for you. He says, what is it? You're going to be an SS war criminal. And he did it, so he must really like us. <laughs> He's versatile, right? He, I, this is the second film I've worked on with Jamie, and uh, you couldn't imagine a, a better partner to work with on, on any film. Jamie, we, we got to the point of being able to look at each other and he'd go, yeah, right, I know what you need. <laughs> and uh, it just it worked out so well. Do you want to speak a little bit about um, the project, Jamie? And yeah. Um I think the hardest part of the project, um, from a cinematographer's point of view, was the, was the fact that half of all the reconstruction you saw was shot in Belgium, 
and the other half was shot in um, Maryland. Now, that sounds okay, except in Belgium we had this beautiful, bright, overcast sky, uh, which was beautiful for us. But then when we went to um, Maryland, it was blue sky, full sun. And there were some shots that we had to match, and there was one particular shot, um, it was Ken's shot, where um, all the soldiers and the jeep that you saw in front of Ken, that Ken was speaking to, all of that was shot in Belgium with the overcast sky. But Ken was shot in Maryland, and we had to match that so that it could all fit in. And it, it was a pretty scary thing to do. It was a pretty scary thing to do, but um, good old Jonathan over there, he got us out of trouble. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> and I think my, my memory of shooting um, the Wereth 11 film was when um, Rob came to me and he said, we've got this um, shot idea. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. But what I'd really like is to see um, an SS soldier, soldier um, point a gun right down the lens of, uh, of the camera. And um, I said, yeah, yeah, sure, no sweat, we'll do that. And then I thought, oh no, hang on a minute, that sounds a bit scary. Call me an adventurous, but um, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Anyway, I went and spoke to the armourer and he said, no, listen, it's fine. We'll put a big bit of perspex in front of the lens. And, uh, and don't forget, it's only blanks. It is only blank, so it's, it's nothing to be worried about. Great. Okay, Rob, we'll do it. So um, there I was, lying down by a tree, holding the camera. The camera was called Harriet. And uh, this guy, he pointed a gun right at me. Bang! And the shell shot out the gun and landed right there on my shirt. And I was thinking, oh no, oh no, it's going to burn, it's going to burn. Oh no, it's okay, it's gone cold. Fine, we're fine. And um, yeah, that pretty much summed up the whole of the shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was uh, putting himself in, in very dangerous situations for me, and I really appreciate it. It wasn't a shoot. It felt like a tour of duty, actually. Yeah, exactly. It was. <laughs> it was. Joe's a rod. So. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I, I guess one of the main motivators uh, for me was growing up with um, a lot of family members, coaches, my friends, parents, fathers uh, that fought in that terrible war. And it wasn't that long ago. And the 333rd was such an outstanding outfit. The more research I did, shooting over 100,000 shells, uh, coming across from Europe, one of the ships in their convoy got hit. But before these, heck, they were mostly kids. Before they arrived on Europe, they had to witness that. And for those of you who don't know, when a convoy is going across and a ship gets hit, orders are for everybody to keep on going. So for all I know, they had to sail right past those guys with some guys in the water. So welcome to the war. And then they landed on the beach, and there was a Army Piper Cub plane flying over, performing observation. And they got orders to get their guns set up ASAP. And they rushed their guns off the ships, set them up, and they fired a round that traveled three miles and knocked a German uh, observer out of a church steeple. So you heard tonight they hit a tiger tank from nine miles away, and that's really something. But that was one of their first shots. The other thing that happened in, uh, on their first day, their forward observer went forward uh, and he never came back. He was killed. So for those of you, and I encourage you, you people, to research and learn about artillery. I sent away and got the original uh, 155 field manual from World War II. And it's, it's like a Bible. And it's not just loading a shell and firing it. There's really a lot of skill and a lot of math and trigonometry. Uh, and, and balancing the gun and different types of ammunition and, and counter battery fire. There's, these guys really, really had to know a lot and, and they, they really performed very, very admirably. So that's what really, really drove me just to, to really pay homage to them. 
that it was not only tragic that the 11 men were killed that way and, and forgotten about, but they really did their jobs and all that was asked for them. And when you're in combat, and I'm sure a lot of veterans here or anywhere else you might meet them will tell you many times, artillery saves the day. It really does. And I remember one German officer was interviewed after the Battle of Bastogne. You saw the 969, which uh, the 333rd was absorbed into, was issued the PUC, which is the highest award a unit can get. Uh, they questioned the German officer and said, what prevented you from taking past stone? And he said the biggest problem they had was every time they went to mount an armored attack, those 155 guns would rain down on them and demoralize his men. So the other thing I tried to do for the younger people today, and I think this is a film for maybe seventh graders right on up, as you watch the film again, you'll see a lot of different layers in there. We wanted to show the MG-42, the 88, the railroad gun. That railroad gun was used during the Battle of the Bulge. Those shells landed in St. Vith and in Schaumburg. Uh, the airplane. Um, all the horrific weaponry. And, and just, just show kids what a wonderful thing our soldiers did not that long ago and and to remember them and to say thank you and uh, I'm just glad we made the film these guys are very very talented I was making phone calls and sending out emails and I I, I was all over the place and they just took all this and pooled their talents and went out. Everybody just became absorbed by the project and went out on their own and researched. Spent hours away from their families, weekends away from their families. And they just engulfed it. And everything that I wanted to see, they, they did it. And, and it's amazing. So thank you very much for that, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Nice to see you here, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting late for George, but yeah. I'm glad you made it. The uh, I just want to say that uh, echo Joe's comments. The uh, when I told my wife this that the driving force or the rallying cry for us was to make a film that was worthy of the 11 men. That was always the uh, uppermost in our, in our minds, our thoughts, and everyone, you know, put their heart and souls into this film because they knew it was an important story. They knew not only had it not been told, but it was a, it was a truly tragic wrong that had been done to these soldiers. And we wanted to give it our absolute best. And this crew here is the A team. I mean, really, it's just amazing. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions here um, from the audience. If you have any to any of us, um, fire away. All right, the question was why did the War Crimes Commission drop the ball on this, and why were the uh, sentences for the war criminals reduced? I could, uh, I could answer that, sir. Uh, I obtained uh, a copy uh, of that war crime report, and the last paragraph reads, this isn't verbatim, but what uh, Colonel Ellis said was, due to the fact that the war has ended and the German army has been discharged, the likelihood of finding the perpetrators who committed this crime would be very unlikely. This case is hereby closed. 
your second question. I'm sorry. It was uh, the sentence. Okay. Sentences. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Senator McCarthy. Okay. McCarthy was very, very outspoken uh, during these war trials. Uh, word got out that many of the Germans were tortured uh, and had mock trials, execution, uh, mock executions, crushed testicles, um, and what he tried to say was that it was a farce. Here we are trying to demand justice and being, you know, in a, in a system of justice, and, and we did some terrible things too. And then the Cold War started, and I think that's part of the reason also. I think at the time, politicians, the military thought that it wasn't highly unlikely that we might need the help of the German army to turn and fight against the Russians. That's what I found. What I tried to do and what I tried to be so careful with and what I tried to emphasize with everybody was, we're going by facts. We're not speculating, okay? I don't know who killed those 11 men. I have an idea, but until I know for certain. And one of my goals to come from this film is for perhaps somebody in Germany, maybe somebody that's gonna meet their maker soon, might wanna speak up and say what happened that day. Because I've heard four or five different stories. So there's still a lot of mystery there, but we just tried to base it on it. But um, that's what the report said, sir. And I'm sure everybody has their own opinions. I, I know I have mine. Yes, another question. This is the sister of George, and she wanted to know why did it take so long for the 30, 333rd to be recognized? That's a great question, and it really comes to the whole issue of black participation in World War II. Um, long before I found that there was a book by the same name, I referred to the black soldiers of World War II as the Invisible Soldiers. Most people have heard of the Tuskegee Airmen, but to the other 250,000 black troops who served in Europe and the Pacific, no one has really ever heard of them. They got a little bit of press during the war, but because of the segregation of the time and the prejudice, they simply did not get the same type of attention. Uh, there were nine black artillery battalions like the uh, 333rd. The vast majority of black troops were in a service role because the official army policy is that they felt that was really all that the black troops were, quote, good for. And the combat troops, such as the 333rd and the others, were really special units. It was almost an experiment. And the important part of their service is because of the uh, performance of units like the 333rd and the 969th is partly what convinced President Truman to desegregate the armed forces because it laid to rest um, years and years long thoughts that uh, uh, black males weren't smart enough to handle artillery, even though there were black artillery units in the Civil War, that they could only do sort of stevedore type work. Uh, so the unit was very important, but there has been virtually no attention to the black soldiers of World War II, with the exception of the focus on the prejudice that they endured both in the Army and out. And I've told Rob this, but I want to say it in front of everything, the most important part of this film is this is the first film that talks about the service of these men. And it has nothing to do with prejudice. These were American soldiers. And Marshall Rainey said something to me a few, a few weeks ago that I, I've just carried with me. He said when he was in England uh, that the best compliment he had is when the English referred to him as an American soldier because the black troopers took pride in the fact that they were soldiers and no matter what anybody else thought they took pride in it the 333rd the 969th were really crack outfits and just to put things in a little bit of perspective and to whet your appetite this that you've seen in this movie is really a small piece of the story because the survivors 
uh, A and B battery and headquarters battery who were evacuated the day before, they ended up at Bastogne with the 969. They were encircled by the Germans. They were with the 101st Airborne the whole time the siege of Bastogne was going on. And that's why they got the presidential unit citation. So there's a lot more history to the black soldiers of World War II that's going on. And it's my hope that more and more people will pay attention so that it's not that they were forgotten. They were never really acknowledged in the first place. But a film like this is very, very important because it focuses on the service. And that's what we should be focusing on, not the prejudice they endured. Yes, that was definitely a part of things, and that reflects on our society at the time, but the service that these men did. And that was, um, that guiding principle came from Joe and everyone on the team. We wanted to show the heroics of them as soldiers, you know, no matter what color they were. They prefer performed heroically and delayed the Germans. Everything that was in there was factual. And what comes out of it is people realize that, yes, black soldiers fought in World War II and bravely on the front lines. And it's my hope with this film that it opens up the door. I feel like there's a whole treasure trove of stories that haven't been told from World War II. And I hope this will open up the door to those stories, and, and not just you know about the prejudice. And no one has more. I just wanted to. Um, this is the first time I've seen the film, by the way. Uh, but what I really wanted to commend Rob for, and to back up what he's saying, if you notice at the end of the film, you saw black soldiers in many different roles. You saw the black Marines on Iwo Jima. You saw black soldiers, not just the Tuskegee Airmen, but in the many different roles that they served in World War II, and that's a great first step to just saying to people they were everywhere. There were Marines on Iwo Jima. There were black soldiers who landed on D-Day. Um, if you've ever seen the pictures, and if you go back and look in the history books of, you know, the dir dirigible balloons that they put up with the wires so that the low-flying planes would run into it, that was an all-black unit, the 331st, that landed on day one at Omaha Beach and put those balloons up. So they, they really were everywhere. We just, I uh, say we, from a historical standpoint, really just didn't take note of it. I uh, hope to be here again next year at about this time doing a follow-up story on another uh, group, the 452nd Anti-Aircraft Battalion. Remarkable group of men shot down over 1,000 German planes and didn't sustain one casualty. Now those planes are going 100 to 300 miles per hour. And they had the deuce and a halves with the quad 50 cal sitting back there like that, over 1,000 German planes. Those guys were special. If you want to read a great little book, it's titled Blood for Dignity. And it tells the story of how the 5th platoon originated during World War uh, II when black troops were brought up to the front lines. Also, a lot of people don't know, most of the black soldiers that went to the front lines during that battle had to take a cut in rank and a 50% pay cut. Yeah, very sad. So all we can do is keep looking for these stories and, and their gems and their special and their American history. And I'll try to do the best I can to, uh, to keep honoring these guys. Because what it comes down to, we're all Americans and they were American soldiers and it's about time this stopped. Right. Thank you. Uh, another question? When my dad and I first, uh, we went back to the Ardennes in 1994 for the 50th anniversary. I did a lot of research to find out where he was, what he did, and we became very, very good friends with the Otter Ricken, who is mentioned, and her husband. And they took us around to some memorials, and the mem one of the memorials they took us to was the Weirath Memorial. 
Now, the memorial you saw in, in Rob's film is the modern memorial, which we're really, really proud of. The original memorial that Hermann Langer, who was speaking in the German, put up was basically a simple cross in the corner of a cow pasture surrounded by barbed wire so the cows couldn't eat the flowers. That, that's what all it was. And when we saw it, and, he, and they told me that this was a memorial to 11 black GIs murdered during the Battle of the Bulge, I've been studying World War II since I could read. And my reaction was, there were black GIs in the Battle of the Bulge? I had no idea, never never heard of it. And that basically is, as they say in the movie Casablanca, what started a beautiful relationship uh, between me and uh, Ada and the memorial and then uh, the research that I've been doing on these uh, um, units. And the wonderful part is being able to find these wonderful veterans uh, to share their stories. Uh, but it sort of all started because my dad was captured and we went back there, and but he was the one that they were trying to help out. Hey. Uh, George, do you want to say anything? Uh, not really. I saw it when it first came out, you know, for everybody on TV. That's the first time I saw it. And I was surprised. <laughs> uh, in a good way? Very good. It was excellent. Oh. And I still say, after seeing more of it, wow. <laughs> ah. Fellows that made it done a good job, believe me. Thank you, George. It's a great compliment. Another question? Well, I get a VA pension. That's about it. <laughs> as far as anything else, I got a Purple Heart. Forget it. Yeah. Let me just add, add on to that. Um, George and I have talked about his benefits, but one of the things that I found out in doing my research is unfortunately a lot of the black veterans when they came home did not really get the same veteran, excuse me, benefits as the white veterans. Uh, one particular story I have of a man uh, from Anniston, Alabama, who was part of Battery C, 333rd, spent five months in POW camp. He went to the VA to apply for POW benefits, and he was told that there were no black POWs. And it was not until the late 1980s, early 1990s, that he was able to get benefits as a POW. So there's a lot of stories like that out there. Um, but fortunately, I think at this point, we've got that corrected, and George has his POW benefits on that, which is great. They, they, they are owed it, that's for sure. Uh, another question? The GI Bill was available to, to all veterans? It was, it, with this caveat, the black veterans in the South, when they tried to use the education part, they were limited as to what college they could go to because the colleges at that time weren't integrated. So yes, they had it, but especially in the South, they were limited. Um, Another question in, in the back? Yes. I'll let Frederick speak to the archival on that, and then uh, we'll address the second question. It, the question was, uh, was it difficult to, to find the archival? And, uh, well, okay. pass it to Frederick. Um, well, basically, uh, since I had just done World War II in HD, which was 10 hours of purely archival, I had some really good contacts and, and good, you know, sources. Um, but with this film, what, what Rob and I talked about, we really wanted to do, we didn't want to use archival just as B-roll. We, we wanted to use historically uh, relevant and accurate archival. And when we really went through the effort of doing that, we found some incredible gems, such as the Malmody trial. At the end, these are the three war criminals that we've been talking about from the beginning, and th this is the actual trial. Um, some other incredible uh, pieces of archival we found. That was Rob told me one day, he said, you're not gonna believe what I just found. And he sent me the, the footage of uh, the African-American uh, with the 155, which we didn't know existed. 
And when we saw that, a side, interesting side note to this is um, when I looked at it, I'm like, Rob, this is very strange. This footage, the archival that you're just showing me, looks just like what you guys shot a, th a couple months ago. I mean, those scenes are like the same. And for an editor, it was like a dream come true. I mean, I, I could cut these things back and forth, and it looked like they had shot the footage after we found the archival, but actually it was the other way around. And, and so many times, and then of course, the grand jam, the, 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 the amazing discovery for an editor was when we saw George's footage. I mean, it, still to this day, every time I see that scene and we see George, you know, I, I get chills down my spine because it's just so incredible to be able to see him as a young man. Um, but so the, the long answer, that was a long answer, but the short answer is there's a lot of tools now where you can find archival by date, by location. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll close with that. And people will ask about the footage of that swim wagon with the, the patrol right at the crossroad when you see Malmody and St. Uh That archival was shot the, just hours after the murder. And it's um, tw 20 minutes away from Rabbit. It's that crossroad where they are. It's 20 minutes away from Malmody and about 15 minutes away from Stavelot. And these guys are celebrating something. They're smoking a cigar across ranks, so they're sharing cigars, which is not typical. And they're full of mud, and they have that swim wagon. And that swim wagon looked, I mean, just that, that whole scene is very eerie. Now, we use that. We're not saying these are the guys who did it. We're saying, you know, somebody somewhere gave us that archival for us to use. And these are the moments, I think, as filmmakers in, in archival-based history shows and films that you feel uh, very grateful that you, you find that kind of stuff. But and we know who had the swim wagons. There weren't a lot left. Um, I think Norm wanted to add how uh, George was found in, in the footage. Well, first of all, that footage of the black POWs has been around for a long time. Uh, it's been in just about every Battle of the Bulge documentary. Um, and most people don't take any notice of it, and no one knew who they were. Um, I was aware of it, and I had a suspicion as I got deeper into my research that it was men of the 333rd, but there was no way to know. When I first made contact with George and I was talking with him, at one point he told me that after the war, he had gone to the movie theater and seen some newsreel footage of black POWs and he saw himself, and it bothered him so much, he didn't go back to the movies for a while. And the light went off in my head. So I made photocopies, because I'd been up to National Archives and I had copied the, that uh, film frame by frame as well as the, uh, the video. And I sent George copies and I said, do you recognize these men? And of course, the picture of him, he says, yeah, that's me. And then he was able to name about six or seven other men of the group of the Black GIs that confirmed these were men of the 333rd Battery C. So we really did not know that until George just told me that little story about seeing himself. Just, just one more point about this, and I don't know if you know about this, but today I saw uh, Beyond All Boundaries, and, and you saw that as well. Yeah. And it, it's an incredible film to show it here every hour. Uh, in this theater, it's like a, a really interesting experience. But George is in that film as well. And I don't think the producers who, sh who produce it know this, but you'll, if you watch that film yeah. tomorrow, every hour, you will see a shot of George in it. Which is amazing. It, it shocked me when I saw that. Another question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this, I'm sorry, the second part. Not to my knowledge, I don't man. believe so. Not to my knowledge. But one thing I, I would like to add, uh, ma'am, as far as uh, children or anybody here doing research, uh, but when I came home, I wrote to the National Archives and requested a copy of the war crime report, and it was sent to me. I then requested for the IDPFs, the Individual Deceased Personnel Files, and they were sent to me on each soldier. 
and I asked for what they call the AARs, the after action reports, and I get the, and the officer reports, the morning reports, and I was able to follow the 333rd from Camp Gruber. They saved the town once. The town uh, had the biggest uh, flood in their history, and all the soldiers went out and helped the farmers and, and a lot of other people too, and that's in there. But the National Archives um, has a lot of information, and it only takes maybe three or four months for it to come. And you, I got the 969ths there also, and they're incredible, talking about German half-tracks coming through the woods and them fighting them off and coming back the next day. And it, it's, it's really incredible history, and it's there for everybody. Another question. So the first question was to George about the arrival of General Patton. And then we'll let Norm take the second. Well, the first time I saw General Patton was in Tatton Hall, England. And uh, <laughs> to me, with them two pearl-handled pistols hanging on him, he, he was a comic. That's what I thought. I didn't know nothing about General Patton, in fact, or any other general over there. But uh, when I first saw him, he did not impress me. The only time I was impressed with him was when my outfit was transferred to help him in the tankers. And all he said was, you need food, live off the land. Clothing, forget it. All we got was gas and ammunition. And uh, convoys, no blackout lights, you roll with black headlights, bright headlights on. Got strafed. So what? Keep going. That was it. As far as the support, first of all, uh, this is, will be a pseudo commercial. We have a, a website that's been up for a while. It's uh, www.wareth.org, and it's got um, a lot, uh, I'll say, a lot more information in detail about the two units and what happened, uh, photographs, things, uh, that type of thing. Um, in terms of what people can do to support it, the most important thing you've done is be here tonight. Be interested and be aware of the contribution of black GIs in World War II. Someone once said, why was I focusing on black GIs? And I said, I, I, I just want them to get their you know, rewards as any other American veteran. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to say they won the war single-handedly. I just want them to take their rightful place with every other veteran who served. Um, the, I, um, the memorial does take donations if you're so interested. Fortunately, uh, we don't, we're not in dire need, but all the donations go towards improving the memorial. Uh, what's really nice is we have four brass plaques in four different languages saying what the memorial is about. There's a beautiful um, sort of uh, like a newspaper type thing within glass that explains everything also in four different languages so that everyone can know about it. Uh, and that's really, just by being interested, uh, you're really helping out more than anything and raising the consciousness about the participation of black GIs in World War II. Uh, another question? Well, the answer to that, I don't think so. We had a job to do and we done it. We didn't think about anything else except doing the job we were supposed to do. That's it. Um, that true soldier. Yeah. This film, um, I'm traveling over to Belgium on Thursday, and this film will actually be premiering in the area where we shot and where the war crime occurred. Um, it's going to be probably 10 miles away from where. And there's a lot of, um, as far as I know, there's two, 200, over 200 people that are coming, including uh, representatives from the army and uh, prime minister of, of German-speaking Belgium. And I had mentioned to uh, Joe and Frederick, I said, this is going to be a real um, emotional film for the Belgians to see, I believe, because of, you know, it was their soil. And I think it's going to be a very powerful premiere over in Europe as well. Um, are there any other questions? 
I believe that's it. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.